Truth is truth. He is, by profession, a poet, as you are about to uh, discover. But more than that, he has become, in recent times, an activist and unexpectedly found himself on the front line of fighting fracking at Balkham in West Sussex. And I'd known Simon for a while, as chance had it anyway, and suddenly there he is at the forefront of, of trying to raise awareness of something which, if you saw me speak early, you'll already know is a a problem, let's put it like that. So we're going to hear today, you know, Simon's personal journey of how he's come to care so much about this and uh, maybe give us all an inkling as to how we can do something about it too. So please put your hands together for Simon Welsh. I really wanted to wear the suit. But it's quite hot, isn't it, really? <laughs> Think yourselves lucky. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Well, I've had a wonderful weekend so far, seeing the talks. It's been amazing. Um, my name's Simon Welsh. I'm a poet. I'm a storyteller. I'm a Muppet, sometimes. <laughs> I'm an anti-fracker. Apparently, I'm an activist as well. I'm also watched by the police, which I love. Um, I did a talk with Andy a couple of weeks ago in Burgess Hill, and I got there to the talk, and he said, the police have just been to visit you. I said, oh, really? He said, yes. They said, oh, someone was giving the talk here tonight. Yes, yeah, just to let you know, we're here if you need us. <laughs> <laughs> so I must be doing something right. I love it. Um, I'll talk a bit more about the police in a minute, because I've had extensive workings with them over the last 18 months. We've got a lot to cover. I've basically got 12 hours of material, and I've got to choose with you over the next 55 minutes exactly what of that 12 hours we put in. Trying to get 12 hours into one isn't going to work, because I'll be speaking 12 times faster than this, and we'll all pass out in 32 minutes. It's not going to work. Um, if I start talking too fast, and it's actually too much for you, and you're not processing the data, just do this at me. I will see respect, pay homage, thank you, and uh, slow down if I can. I get quite excited. So we've got just after five o'clock. I've got an hour. I'm going to keep on looking around every 20 minutes or so and really try and time it. Um, we are going to be talking about anti-fracking, but I came into anti-fracking from something else, which is this whole thing that we're doing this weekend. You know, Illuminati, dark forces, spiritual awakening. What the heck is going on on our planet? This is one of the most terrifying and exciting times simultaneously we could ever have hoped to have been born into. I totally believe we all chose to be here. Um, I'd actually like to dedicate this talk today to Gemma. Uh, there's loads of people that I'm dedicating it to. Listing everybody would be crazy. But Gemma was very brave earlier when she spoke up and said, actually, when you just jump into this and it just seems like horror story after horror story, are we supposed to go away and, you know, whatever, you know, jump in front of a bus? Where's the hope? Very difficult to ask that question in an environment like this, but apparently a lot of people came up to her afterwards and said, thank you very much, you took the words right out of my mouth. Well done for speaking out. I have a lot of dark materials to cover in my talks. I, 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 I do it a lot, but I come from a platform of celebration because we have so much to celebrate. Human beings are phenomenal. And over the next hour, I'm going to show you, amongst other things, why I think why. Yeah, that's right. Um, so, as an introduction to me, my opinions, what I think and what I do, I'm going to do something on this computer here. <laughs> Hang on. Uh, where is it? It's... And we're going to move from the generic into the specific. Uh, not that one, yes. Right, this is a piece called Friend or Foe. This is a special piece of code now. Can we do mute on this one? No one understood what that meant, did they? Awesome. No, right, I We're so subtle, I love it. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. Um, here we go, let's see if this works. So, oh, hang on, do I need to do something here? Possibly I do. <laughs> That's on pause. Hmm. All right, Bray. It's not, it's not being me being a Muppet, no? Hey, I've got 55 minutes to do that. <laughs> Signed, brilliant. 
So this is a poem called Friend or Foe, which really wraps up the kind of stuff we've been talking about all weekend. Do, do, do. Here we go. Right, now, it's not lip syncing, but I do need to time it right if I can. So I wrote this in conjunction with uh, the crossing over of Elenin, the comet. NASA says the planet's safe, that there's no need to worry. And yet the world seems poised for change and in a massive hurry. America is sending troops to fight the Middle East. The convicts at Guantanamo have still not been released. Financial stocks are falling fast. Dollar, euro, pound. Questions in the sky and yet no answers on the ground. Is Ellen in the sign the Hopi elders called Kachina? Is Obama African or half Egyptian, half hyena? Was 9-11 <laughs> an inside job to push the Patriot Act? How many other cities in the world will be attacked? What exactly is a frack? Is their agenda clean? Are they putting poisonous liquids in the ground that can't be seen? Is it true that HIV is not a real disease? Was the lunar landing staged? Will someone tell me, please? I do not mean to sound like a freak or a fanatic, and I know I have this tendency to lean towards dramatic, but something really isn't right upon our little home. We can hide ourselves in incense, dreadlocks, build a geodome, but something's coming, something big. Will aliens arrive? Do we all have to go to Denver airport to survive? Is Queen Elizabeth a lizard? David Icke insane? Do the Anunnaki want to flush our spirit down the drain? If the end is near, then should I stop watching porn? As we near galactic zero, will we be reborn? Why do they put fluoride in the water that we drink? Why did they ban magic mushrooms? What do people think? When I look around, I see a system near collapse, but mostly I'm not scared because I know the truth, perhaps. <laughs> it's not a guarantee, and it may not work for you, but I'd like to share it now if you're prepared to hear me through. I know that I've been ranting, but I've got a point to make. This is only my opinion, but it makes me feel awake. None of it is relevant, all these epic questions. No one has the answers. At our best, we have suggestions. The future isn't written. It is ours to craft and shape. It makes no difference if we came from alien or ape. The world could blow apart, or we could be enslaved by a microchip that switches off if we're not well behaved. The golden age could start today, soft and slow, to tease us. It could turn out that we're immortal. That would surely please us. But whether it's a suitcase nuke, a riddle, or a lie, the price for being human is the body seems to die. But body death is not the end. This life is just a fraction of what's really going on in this cosmic chain reaction. The earth is rising constantly to meet a new vibration, a density that's bringing forth the age of co-creation. I think we're all rising with it. Does this feel true? The end times are aligning us so we can all get through. I think the age of separations coming to an end. The cosmic heart is waking. Intuition is our friend. So though we're still perplexed by questions, ego-driven doubt, the ego is a tool that I could not do without. When I let my heart's vibration tell my ego gently that I do not need a bigger or to drive a Bentley, it also tells my ego that its help is now required and please to stop this fighting as we're all a little tired. Heart can drive the instrument I call the human being. Ego can co-navigate and help the heart with seeing. Heart can help the ego feel, always be in flow, and together they will co-create the world I wish to know. When I think of life like this, those questions do not matter. Answered questions only serve the need for ego chatter. 
The truth is that we do not need to know the ins and outs. All we need to do is let the heart dispel our doubts. So, that gives you a bit of an insight in what I do. I'm a storyteller, I'm a poet. I feel the universe often driving me forward um, from behind, you know. And it doesn't really have words. It's like sticking your fingers into the mains. That's what happened with the fracking. I was just at home. I'd had quite a busy spring doing some bits and bobs, writing a little bit of poetry getting interactive with my Facebook fan page, you know, what do people want to hear a poem about today? And then people would put lists of things they wanted to hear about on the Facebook, and I'd then try and incorporate all those ideas into a single piece the same day, record it, upload it, and they'd all go, brilliant! And I always try and incorporate the message of spiritual awakening in there, because I feel we're on an amazing journey as a unified consciousness remembering itself at the moment. And then my housemate Rob says, Simon, the frackers are coming. And we'd been down to the village hall a year before. The whole village had turned up there. Quadrilla came along with their American CEO and he was like, oh, Balcom sounds amazing. Let's all drink tea and talk about fracking. He had no idea that the uh, chairman of Brighton's Energy Collective, Will Cottrell, was gonna come down and show scenes from Gasland, Josh Fox's movie, prior to his getting up on the stage and meeting all the people with the tea. Um, <laughs> What an idiot. I mean, God, it was like, so by the time this guy got on stage, we'd all seen pictures of people setting fire to their tap water and, you know, like great big holes opening in the ground and cars falling into them and God knows what else. It was insane. So people were baying for blood in a room this size, this full of people. And this poor American guy was like, I thought the British were so polite. What's going on? You know, ah. And, um, and then nothing happened for a year. I mean, we made it so abundantly clear that nobody in the village wanted this. And um, suddenly they were coming. You know, West Sussex County Council, uh, Mid Sussex District Council, whoever, they all get together. It's this rubber stamping system. I had no idea how these systems worked until we needed them and they weren't there. Environment agency as well. Oh, it's all right. We're protected, aren't we? Brilliant. Yeah. And then when you need them, you start to discover what they're actually for. And it is scary, it is horrifying because the whole lot's been sewn up. And I'll talk about that over the course of the talk, but there's so many other things I want to share with you, and it's celebration time. Um, <laughs> it really is. Um, so anyway, got down there with Rob. He dropped me off there because he was on his way to work, and it wasn't that far from home. It was about 15, 20 minutes walk, maybe, uh, from my house, which was just outside Bulkham Village. I didn't know any of the residents in Bulkham. I'd lived there for four years. But the main part of the village, you know, you've got, I don't know, people playing golf, maybe. I mean, there's a local primary school and stuff, and there's me, sort of a hippie, you know, at the time I'm claiming housing benefit. I don't own my own property. I have five housemates. We're sort of Lewis Brighton-type people. You know, there's a shaman, there's a wild man who teaches kids how to make fire out of nothing in the woods. We're not very conventional. We're certainly not Middle England, you know, conservative tea drinkers. Um, so there was no call to be friends with people in the village, and then this is, what, this is why... I mean, I'm going to give you David Cameron quote now, and I'm going to say it like it's my own. I love fracking, but I love it for a very different reason than David Cameron. He loves it because he's in service to the dark forces. Fair enough. Knock yourself out, you silly old muppet. Uh, <laughs> what, what, what a monkey. I hope he wakes up one day crying with shame. I really do. And I will be there to give him a hug if he does. I will. You know, I mean, I'm sure that when he was born, he wasn't an arse. <laughs> I reckon that, you know upbringing and, you know, childhood and school and grooming. They get groomed, these people, you know, and they get their soul pulled out of them a little bit at a time. That's why shamans are around, you know, soul loss and soul retrieval. These exercises are real for the kind of fractures that happen to us, all of us, all the way through our childhood and teenage years. So, yes, I'll give him a hug if he stops being a monkey. Um, I love fracking because it brought all the hippies all the activists, all the anarchists, and all the posh people from Balkan together. Have you ever seen what happens in, um, whew, sorry, an apartment building at nighttime in a power cut where people prior to the power cut don't know each other? Power goes off, what happens? Yeah? 
people come out. They come out. Hello. Oh, isn't this exciting? It's just like the war. What fun. Have you got tea bags? I've got a kettle that doesn't need electric. Hooray. What's your name? Brilliant. Chat, chat, chat. Everyone has a celebration. They celebrate. We celebrate during trauma. That's what we do. Now, we've forgotten about celebration. So what do we need to start celebrating again? Bingo. That's why I love fracking. And not just fracking. The amount of trauma that we are undergoing as a species right now is the amount of trauma we need to be undergoing to get us a kick up the arse that we need to remember that we're not just in the bloody movie. I mean, we're all sitting in the cinema seats looking at the horror film and going, God, isn't this terrible? But we're also the projectionists, the scriptwriters. We're doing it all. We create the story. And in order for us to step out of inactivity and into proactivity, we have to undergo trauma for every single individual to reach what I call the enough is enough point. Everyone's got a different threshold. Mine was Quadrilla coming to my doorstep. So yeah, I guess you could call me a NIMBY at that point. Not in my backyard. Um, as it turns out, actually, I'd rather be called a noop. Not on our planet. Thank you very much. Or hang on. New. Not in our universe. <laughs> it doesn't have an, an acronym that sounds any good. New. Yeah, okay. But yeah, fracking is horrific. Do we know about fracking? Does, can you raise a hand if you're not familiar with the technicalities behind the process of hydraulic fracturing? That's enough. Thank you. On with the videos. This was a video that I made. Um... Okay, so I went down to the site. All these people will arrive. There's a lorry on the side of the road. It had a banner on the side of it. I'm like, they've hijacked a lorry. This is brilliant. Oh, there's a fridge. There's a freezer. There's sinks. There's port being built. They're making a family. This is insane. Ooh, I might come down here once a week. This is great. And I started to make a few friends with people. I live in the village. Isn't it nice? Oh, you live in the village. Oh, you're a book and resident. I'm sort of. I'm a poet. Oh, but right. Okay, you're one of us then, aren't you? Brilliant. Um, and I could see very quickly this division. People from the village weren't really coming down to the site. And I don't blame them. The newspapers were telling these horror stories and putting pictures in the press of all violence and craziness and anarchist hippies and angriness. And if I was a Balkan resident and didn't know, I'd look at those papers and say, I'm not going down there. Aren't they clever? It's not even like they do it on purpose. It's not part of the conspiracy. They do it to sell the papers. That's it. That's the only reason, anyway. So anyway, there was one day when some guys were linked together some dudes, some ladies, linked arms, sitting on logs in front of the gates. This was in about five days in, four days in. And the police wanted to break them up to open the gates to get lorries to go in. And they couldn't break them up, so they used pressure point tactics under their necks. And they bent their fingers back and all sorts of other childhood playground tactics, which you can totally call police brutality if you want to. But that actually creates a drama that isn't really going on out of a sense of outrage. And it's not accurate. When I saw it, I'm like, this is police brutality. I'm going to go home and make a YouTube video and they're all going to hate the police and I'll have done a good job. I started making the video, went back the next day, and then there was this gorgeous man, this policeman, and this beautiful lady policewoman. I'm like, oh, hello, you're really nice. And we had a chat. It turned out they lived in a local area. They hated what they were doing. But when you put on the police uniform, you're not allowed to have a personal opinion. And when I got home that day, I couldn't carry on making a video about police brutality because I was actually going to be inciting hatred against a group of people who were really trying to do their best. So I changed the video. I changed the style, and this is how it ended up. And I'm showing this video because this is a really basic but good into fracking. I found the music on audio micro. Ah, this one. May we have... Oh, this is code, by the way. Sound. Yep. Excellent. Okay, I've got sound here, so put that up there. Press play and...
from this. Why do you want to go out Because it is a law for us. Because you are obstructing. 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 You are obstructing.
No, apparently not. <laughs> Never mind. I've got a real soft spot for the police. They have actually been very, very nice to me. Um, there's bridges to be built there. So this Jerusalem tune was going around in my head, and suddenly I realized I was supposed to rewrite it. And I thought about it, and I thought about William Blake, and I love William Blake. You know, Songs of Innocence versus Experience, and all his visions of angels, and big fat ladies, and all the other things he wrote about, just entrancing, you know. And so I rewrote this um, anthem. We're going to sing, by the way, at the end. Yeah, the last six minutes, we are all going to sing. I've got the words and everything. So we'll have a little, <clears throat> and then we'll do it. So if we haven't started at 10 to, someone point at me. Um, and I rewrote this anthem. And I went down to the site, and I tried it out with a few people, and we had 20 or 30 people singing it together, and it sounded pretty awful, but it, everyone knew the tune then. And as I left, there was a lady, and she said, are you from the village? I said, yes. She said, oh, so am I. A whole bunch of people from the village are coming down tomorrow to the site to, you know, meet the protesters. We're all a bit nervous, and we'd like something to sing. Can we have that? And I said, yes. It was very interesting timing as well. I was supposed to be going to Gay Pride that weekend in Brighton. But earlier that week, I got a gum infection, and they said to me, with the antibiotics, don't drink any alcohol. And I thought, well, I don't trust myself not to go to Pride and just dance it up and get mashed. So I'm not going to go at all. And that was the reason I happened to be there that day. The next morning, I ended up at the recreation ground with 30 sheets of this anthem, giving it out, and megaphones being thrust into my hand. Simon, tell everybody what you'd like. Simon lives in the village, but we don't know him. He's been here for four years, but he lives and does writing in the woods. So here he is, and what do you want? I'm like, well, I'm looking at 150 people that have lived in this town, this village, all their lives, most of them. And it was like, ooh, wow, <laughs> nowhere to go. Um, quite like that feeling, actually, that feeling of being cornered, just as well, really. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I don't mean to be funny, it just happens, you know that, right? <laughs> and um, so I said on the mic, well, you know, all the newspapers are telling these stories about the hippies and the anarchists and the activists over here and the village people with their tea and their neck curtains and their pretty front gardens over here not liking the hippies. Who are these smelly people who don't wash and have invaded our town? No one had been actually saying that. It just sells the papers. So I said, I've got the camp phone number and they've been singing it yesterday. So if we can go down there, I already know, Channel 4, ITV, Sky News, BBC, they're all down there filming live. Very exciting. Why don't we rewrite the media by demonstrating what it looks like when everyone's singing it together? They were like, that's an interesting idea. So we did. We marched down the hill like a weird band from the 1850s <laughs> or something. Um, and um, halfway down the hill, we were neither up nor down. I <laughs> phoned the camp phone and said, start singing now. So they did. And although they weren't on the same words that we were when we arrived, it didn't matter. It looked fantastic on camera. And that was the point. Uh, and in me, I had this feeling of, come on then, come on then. I, you know, not like I want to fight, but I do want to fight. I, absolutely, every step of the way. Every wrong needs to be righted. Every lie needs to be addressed. Every dark corner, every shadow needs to have a spotlight shone on it from open hearts and absolute truth, which means learning about vulnerability. <laughs> And in order for that to happen, we have to allow ourselves to be vulnerable. If you've got skeletons, it is time to open your cupboard and go, love me anyway. It's not a question, it's a request, actually. Love me anyway. They're not going anywhere, these skeletons. Love me anyway. And what you find is that if you love yourself anyway with those skeletons in that open cupboard, everyone else is gonna. The only person standing in the way of that is you. And when you live like that, when you move like that, when you walk through life like that, you are surrounded by allies. And even those who think they might be your enemies come at you with knives or guns or fists. You're just there with roses falling all about you. And they just start sort of, you know, uh, well, I was going to hug. You know, I mean, it, you can see the transformation happening. This is why I got arrested. <laughs> We're so exciting. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, we did this lovely anthem. It was gorgeous. It went all over the news. Um, and then someone said, would you put an event on around this? And I said, around the singing? And they said, yeah. And I said, well, I'm not really a singer. <coughs> yeah, okay. And I got home and I went, right, I've done event organizing before. We need 400 people minimum. I'm going to have to make friends with all of the police. 
right. I picked up the phone. I phoned the police. I said, right, Sunday after next, we're doing a thing. We want the road closed. That's not going to happen. Why not? Because we won't close the road. Organised. I said, so you'll close it in an emergency? I said, yeah. He said, okay, then I'm a clairvoyant. There's going to be an emergency the Sunday after next, and you're going to need to close the road because there's going to be loads of people accidentally on it very suddenly out of nowhere. And they said, we can actually do it like that. I said, really? He said, yeah, as long as you work in line with us and tell us exactly what you're going to do and work with us. I said, hey, listen, I will work with you every step of the way. If you give me everything I want, I will give you everything you want. And I'll start giving first. I'm totally happy with that. So I worked very closely with the police. I had quite a lot of anti-fracking people pissed off with me for including spies in my plan. I'm like, listen, I am not going to speak to a script that says they're, they're deviant or devious. I'm going to speak to a script that says these are gorgeous, wonderful people who all have rather a sexy uniform, in my opinion. Brilliant. Who are here to help. I'm going to speak to them that are helping. I'm not interested in speaking to them who are not helping. And I will then magnetise them who are helping to me. So I get that you've got a story and a script and you've been an activist for a lot of years and you fight and you've been in prison many times and I commend you for that. And I can't listen to any more of you telling me to keep guarded because those boys with the blue tabards on are actually listening and spying. They might be. But when Andy told me at Burgess Hill the week before last, they come to just check up on you, I genuinely didn't feel spied on. I felt like that, that nice chap who was sitting there earlier. What's your name? You're giving a talk tonight. Ken. Ken. Thank you, Ken. I feel special. I feel looked after. Thank you very much. Yes, and I do deserve the red carpet from you. Quite right. You know, that is how we can all operate if we choose to. No, they're looking at me, they're listening to me. If I'm that important that out of millions of people, they're singling me out to phone me up when I make a Facebook update to tell me I've got something wrong. <laughs> Brilliant. Simon, could you just change those words there? Because you've said something about Katie Bourne and the chief superintendent and it's not actually accurate. I'm like, oh, well, I'll, yeah, sure I will. But I'll say it's a quote from you. <laughs> so... Um, I put this event on, and within seconds of deciding to do it, the phone was ringing off the hook. Choir directors, people who wanted to bring me bits of stage, speakers, all the stuff just came in. Two weeks later, 600 people gathered on the side of the road, and this is what we did. Mm. Where are we? Oof, not long now. <laughs> turnout of people from literally all over the country to basically let it be known to all elected representatives and to the industry that uh, fracking is not going to be tolerated in anyone's backyard in this country. So, do not fight these changes as they spring into existence. They're here to pave the way for us so we may go this distance. The conduit, conduit is closing. closing. It's, it's time, time to take, to take this, this deal. deal. Time to wake up now from this dream we thought was real. Standing up and, and singing for, for what matters to me, really, here along with hundreds of other people who are, are doing the same. It's like a dream come true to me, really. Um, it, it matters. It's the um, most important thing I've ever done, I think, really, turning up here today. We want them to hear us! Now shout! Now look up! They're watching from satellites! So birds, please. A few sheep.
showed the strength of feeling. It showed that this isn't just Balkan. I mean, there are a lot of Balkan people here. Um, it shows that it goes well beyond Balkan, that this is a nationwide issue. For me, this is about grassroots democracy. There's a whole lot of people countrywide that don't want to see this industry taking off in a big way. And um, I think this is the beginning of people beginning to say, no, we don't want it. And when are our officials, our elected representatives, going to start listening to us? This is potential ecocide. That's why we're here. So please, do whatever you can. Do it with social media. By all means, write to the Environment Agency. They're not listening, but at least we can say we did. Write to your MP. Get more bodies down here. Get it out there. Get it out there on Facebook. Invite everyone you know. We need to show that the vast percentage of the population of this country can see through the disingenuity, is putting it politely, of our ministers who are saying there is no evidence of harm. So... We celebrated, and we celebrated all summer. And it wasn't always easy, and it wasn't always celebration, because on days when you're not having parties, you've got police marching behind protesters who are marching in front of trucks to keep them slow, stamping on the backs of their heels, hard, with big boots on. And they weren't Sussex police either, they were Thames Valley police, called in to assist because there's so many protesters, and it's just amazing. We are, we are in World War Three, okay? People talk about war like it might start soon. We're in it, okay? It's a digital assault on us. It comes in through the media, it comes in through the internet, it comes in through television. It's about programming us with apathy while this corporatocracy continue their global takeover plan. Could I just ask you to raise a hand if you believe that that is true? Brilliant. Good. It is. And this is where we need to celebrate. As far as I'm concerned, this may sound radical, but after the talks we've had this weekend, I don't mind saying it. I think we are part of an intergalactic community and we are remembering who we used to be. And we are being assisted in ways that we don't even understand to be braver than we ever thought we could be as we move into the darker parts of end times, which are coming for us fast now. And singing is something that is going to become very important. I'm not a big fan of lots of parts of the Bible because there's so many control mechanism, mechanisms in there that have been added since. But if you look where it talks about Christ coming the first time as the lamb and then coming the second time as the lion, I had a dream about a lot of people singing together with this roar this huge roar. And when we blend our voices as one, I think that people coming together and blending their hearts as one is the actuality of what Christ returning to the earth is going to look like. It's Christ consciousness. It's Buddhic consciousness. It is re-assimilating with the great all that there is whilst continuing the luxury of having an individual human body to walk around and do this and make things. We have an earth life. We are the envy of so many non-physical entities in the universe. You know how many trillions of things queue up to get an earth life? And we fought to get here. And we got here. And then we sit and watch Coronation Street. Really? <laughs> no. <laughs> So, zero point energy. Ah, oh, just got time for this before we start singing. Um, oh, have we got time for that as well? Let's just see. We don't want to be cheeky. I know we're going to get cut off on the hour. I get it, I get it. <laughs> uh, that's three minutes and 44, and that is four minutes and eight. Okay, I'm going to tell you about the World War Three project because it's awesome. We're not going to watch it. Type it in on YouTube. It's a spoof. It's like one of those Kickstarter campaigns. A lot of American people, we're starting the World War III project and we need money for World War III because Obama is dead ass broke. So we need you to give us $3.8 trillion. Um, this is what we're going to do. We're going to get organic grass fed bombs that you can remote control by iPad. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. Here's what we're going to do with your money. Here's all the wars we're going to start. Here's why. And it's the, the, when you see like an American organization with very high production values ripping the stuffing out of their current president. Oh, but people are trying to impeach Obama all over the States for having a false birth certificate. This whole illusion is coming down. We are in the time of great collapse and from collapse comes something brand new and we get to write what that is. 
yeah? We get to choose, but we have to be active in the roles that we play. If we just sit watching it like it's a film, things will happen and we'll say, ah, oh, th throw some popcorn at the screen. We're in the movie. This is our movie. And loads of other people are watching. You know that whole Big Brother feeling? Okay, imagine hundreds of thousands of entities from all different planets, all over all the galaxies, watching our planet ascending dimensionally through time space into a fifth dimensional expression of itself where we get to live as three dimensional and five dimensional. It's actually third and fifth density, by the way. There's a slight distinction there. Miracles are going to happen in our lifetime and the world is going to look so different by the time we die, I think, than it does now. Because we are manufacturing a new earth, quite literally, as we speak. All possibilities that you could imagine are happening simultaneously and we are actually jumping at the moment from universe to universe. We can't tell because the new one we jump to seems so the same. You know, like a movie, you watch it, it looks like a consistent linear thing, but if you go into the projection booth, it's actually lots of little freeze frames running together. That's what reality is like. Freeze frame moments and we jump through them in what appears to be a linear fashion that makes it look like one consistent storyline, but actually we're jumping from frame to frame. That means we are jumping from universe to universe. If you don't like the way your life is, I'm going to ask you all now, don't answer me because it's too much. What do you spend most of your time doing? Does it make your heart sing? If the answer is no, after the symposium, review. <laughs> yes, stern face <laughs> and bare feet. Brilliant. Um, but yeah, it's time. We have no more time to waste. It is time to review. If what you do with your life does not make your heart sing, Find out what does and start doing it because then you will be living in celebration and you will become the vibrational climate of change that will marinate your local universe and then the external universe in those higher frequencies. You will become the beacon. You will become the lighthouse. Others will gravitate towards you. They will marinate in your higher frequencies. They will start manufacturing it for themselves. No more fish, only fishing rods. We all have Christ consciousness or Buddha consciousness or heart consciousness available to us right now. I got arrested for singing on the side of the road. Three police wouldn't, I couldn't stop singing. I looked into their eyes. I couldn't stop singing. I was thinking we're connecting brother to brother. They're all beautiful and I'm looking into their eyes and I'm trying to find the soul in there. Come, brother. And they're going, and I'm going, and I'm crying and I'm thinking about the hydrochloric acid being poured down the well and it's like, this has got to work. And then suddenly I'm getting nicked and dragged off. I wrote a poem in my jail cell. I love it. I was in prison for six hours. <laughs> but I wrote a poem in there. I also turned the tables on their heads. Now, so there's me. This is really interesting. Crawley Police Station. Oh. <laughs> Crawley Police Station. Stop moving. If I move really fast now, does time slow down? <laughs> Shall we try it? <laughs> Wind it back. Wind it back. Um, so I'm in Crawley Police Station. There's 16 cops behind the desk. They already think I'm very, very funny because I got to the front and then I had to fill out this form on a computer screen. And one of the questions was, have you done any legal drugs in the last 24 hours? I smoked a big fat reefer early that day. Big doobie. Lovely. Very nice. Homegrown. Nice. Not mine, homegrown. Somebody else's. But I thought, well, I don't want to lie. The whole point of this is I must go through with the light. But please, they're asking me to just do this bliff and I don't want to just say, yeah, that's just stupid, right? I mean... <laughs> So I'm frowning on this question. She's like, are you stuck? And I say, well, there's this question here. And I want to... And she's like, what did you do? I'm like, I smoke. She's like, he had a smoke, everyone. <laughs> and basically, this form was just to make sure that I couldn't OD in my cell. It was nothing to do with the record or anything. So they already found me very funny. And then I'm standing there. And this guy who looks like he goes down the gym every day with a very handsome, chiseled face called Rob... He's kneeling in front of me. He's got his hands on my ankle and he says, Simon, I'm going to have to frisk all the way up your inside thigh. You're not going to like it. <laughs> I look down and before I can even stop myself, I'm just like, want to bet, you know. <laughs> it was too late. It was done. It was done. He looks up at me like, oh my God. I'm looking down at him. I'm like, well, you did ask. <laughs> you know, and for me, it wasn't an unfamiliar, you know. And the police behind the desk are falling off their chairs. He is looking so emasculated, this great, big, hunky alpha male looking raped, while he continues technically to take away my freedom. 
He's putting his hands up. My, he still had to go up, didn't he? All the way up. All the way. He went that far, and I said, you know, I might have, like, a pointy weapon in there. You know? <laughs> you better check. And then we're just like, ah! Rob's got a boyfriend! <laughs> And it suddenly wasn't a police station anymore. It was a playground and we were all having fun together whilst I'm being processed and getting arrested. I just thought, stuff these rules. They don't fit in my reality. I'm not playing that game. I'm playing this game. You can come and play with me if you want to. It was just open heart, open heart all the way. Got in the cell, wrote a poem. <sighs> Haven't got time for it. It's on my website. By the way, www.simonwelchpoetry.co.uk. On Facebook, I'm Simon the Poet. On Twitter, I'm Simon the Poet. And I have not a huge number of first edition A5 hardback of my second poetry, but with a CD in the back for sale out there. They're going like hotcakes, so you better run as soon as the talk is over, you see. <clears throat> and I'll sign them. Um, this poem, though, ended with, so how do we say no to this corporate agenda? Who, if not the police, will be humanity's defender? As I sit here in this prison cell, I know not what to do, though I feel the answer stirring in the hearts of me and you. My solicitor came to visit me about three hours later. He's like, what's that poem? Read it to me. There you go. That's your prepared statement. It's the idea of interviewing you in five minutes. Read them that and then say no comment to every other comment. I did. It went into the legal system. I used it to defend myself in court. And at the end, the judge looked at me and said, Mr. Welsh, when you came here, I did not believe in the Zen zone. <laughs> His face went funny when he said it as well. <laughs> but after three days of listening to what people have got to say about you and what you have said about yourself and the way you've defended yourself to Mr. Edwards, the prosecutor, <laughs> uh, I know that you think you're telling the truth. You are a most unusual defendant, and I mean that in the nicest possible way. You are free to go. So I told a poem about the corruption in the police force, and the judge thought it was awesome. And even the police who was called up to give evidence against me really struggled to do that. And when it was time for him to speak in my favour, even though he was an against me witness, he was like, yeah, well, Simon and I, learn, learn. My, my barrister was like, you call him Simon, do you? When you greet each other, how do you greet? Do you shake hands? Well, we hug. <laughs> <laughs> Love will win this. Now, lastly, because we've only got, we've, got, we've got nine minutes or eight minutes or something like that. Eight minutes? Eight minutes, right. So we want to get two anthems out of this. We're going to sing Jerusalem with the anti-fracking words and the other anthem that we did, which we need to sing today. Anyone ever enjoyed singing God Save the Queen? Yeah. You've enjoyed singing it? Excellent. Okay, well, that's a surprise to me. Um, I found it a bit dull, but later in my life, I looked at the original lyrics, and it's a black magic spell. The second verse actually says, Scatter her enemies and make them fall. Confound their politics, frustrate their knavish tricks. When we hear that, we invoke it. And we sing to a sovereign that isn't in here. We actually put the queen as a position between us and the all that there is in the universe. We don't need a direct connection with you, God. We've got a sovereign. Mistake. And the only way we can bring it back is to sing it back. Both of these pieces invoke the lion, which is the collective consciousness blending together in one voice. This is what the future is about, and this is how we're going to end this talk. So... Would we like to sit or would we like to stand? Stand, then, if you will. Can we make it bigger? Possibly. Hang on, there's a little thing there. What does that do? Oop, 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 oop. Yeah, does that work? Okay, great. Let's start with Jerusalem. Frank in ancient times, think waters once so clean, and were there filthy rigs of doom on England's pleasant pastures seen, and did the only face of truth shine forth upon our clouded hills and do the frackers know time is up to use their dark satanic drills feel it coming up through your feet like the earth Just 
is not very nice. Recently, she's done two things that have really pissed me off. Oh, I should have words with her. We share a birthday, 21st of April. How dare she? I am the queen. <laughs> oh God, that's yucky. Yeah. <laughs> so one thing she did was uh, in 2010, she signed something with the Pope called the Hollywood Agreement, which I just discovered in my kind of pedophilia government Westminster cover up investigations, which basically signs the Church of England into the same deal the Catholic Church have about having a vow of perpetual silence and stonewalling the police if they ever ask about paedophilia within the church. Church of England is now under a vow of silence. That's been so for the last three years. Unbelievable and true. You can look it up. Uh, there's also an exemption clause in something from 2011 which says that the, the, the monarch cannot be interrogated by the police for anything until 20 years after their death. Awesome. Yeah. Other things she did. Oh, there's quite a few things, actually, isn't there? Yeah. You know you can get fracked under your land now. Now, that might be the Queen, that might be the Crown, the City of London. It's all a bit of a blur what that all is anyway, some entity. But, yeah, they can frack under your home now without your permission because you technically now in England only own the land under your home down to a certain depth. But yet below, below that, it's the property of the Crown. So they can go down over there in the fracking, come under there, two miles, under your house, your water gets polluted, you don't even know it's happening. So, this is to take back our sovereignty. Everyone knows about the sovereign being, right? It's all linked in with common law and what's going on in here. The signals is coming, the energy is coming. Our brothers and sisters have awakened, we are being called into existence. Our future selves are calling us forth as agents of spirit. We don't have to worry too much because we're, we're being pulled into the future from now. This is the past as far as they're concerned and they're bringing us forward and all we have to do is let ourselves be pulled from here and feel it if you can while we sing this and that will be the end of my talk. Shall we try it out? Sing it to her, okay? As well, we're going to really sing it to her. She'll feel it because she is the living in you. <laughs> Victorious, happy. 